Hello, I'm Dan. I'm Simon. And this is the Wikicast, a podcast where Wikipedia takes us to a random article each week and we talk about what we find. Simon, what are we talking about this week? This week, Daniel, we're talking about Juris Silovs, bracket athlete. Wow, okay. Have so we had I, don't, a, I, don't I don't think we've had a sporting personality before, have we? Not a person, no. We've, we've had teams before, and we had the, in our infamous drunk episode, we did the Summer Olympics, the, sorry, Lithuania at the Youth Summer Olympics mm-hmm. in 2010. Yeah. But I don't think we've had an individual before, no. so this is a first, Gosh. a first for the channel. What's also a first for the channel is possibly uh, one of your dear presenters being carried away by the rain, uh, because I, I was demonstrating to Dan before we started recording just how outrageously wet um the outside of my room is right now mm. so i it is literally as if somebody is directing a hose at my window yeah uh, we currently have storm gareth coming through the uk which is possibly the least intimidatingly named storm ever is it pretty um, windy but, with you then or is it just heavy rain it has been it has been very windy yeah, yeah. um it's actually been quite difficult to because obviously i've got the, the second one of the half marathons that i'm doing is this weekend mm. um and it's been quite difficult to actually get out and run um because i am i have a large surface area and i act like a sail yeah. if it's uh, particularly windy and it's been raining and mank and i haven't done as many runs as i'd like basically which does make me a little bit on edge but i did do five miles uh like two days ago and it felt com- as if i'd barely run anything mm-hmm. so i feel like my fitness is still up there i just had to remind myself that i, I was still capable of doing it yeah but bloody basically if one of us if i disappear uh it's because of the extensive wind and rain that's finally burst into my my office is it because it has been bad for you hasn't it yeah it has it's been well it's 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 still pretty dreadful now to be honest the rain isn't too bad um, it's it's fairly kind of it's more like spray than kind of heavy big drops of rain, but it's mm. really windy. Um, I'm I'm dead sure that in the next two months my fence is going to fall down because it's ju- it's I think the kind of the the, the beams. This is going to get incredibly technical, and I'm going to come fail miserably at trying to give paint a word picture of what's going on. Um, <laughs> but the if you imagine in between each of the fenced panels you've got like a post that goes into the ground to keep it kind of grounded, you know? Yeah. Um, one of those big posts, I think, has kind of rotted from the bottom. So it's not really in the ground at all. It's being held up by the posts on either side. So there's this one section that's just acting like a massive like fan <laughs> um, and we're kind of flipping back and forth. Um because your the fence has been in peril previously, like previous it previous has. readers will have <laughs> remembered the the great epic of Dan's fence. I think the issue is previously, um, previously on Dan's garden, um, dun, dun. we we had before we kind of ripped everything out of the garden and redid it. There was a there was so much kind of foliage in there that it was giving it kind of like a a false sense of security. It was like, oh, I'm actually really <laughs> secure. Um, because everything else was just, you know, there were various different creepers and things kind of keeping, giving it kind of like a natural ballast. Um, however, now, because everything's been stripped away, the fence is really realising just in what a kind of sorry state it is. Um, and it will absolutely come down at some point. I've also, we've got a trowel um, that's kind of hung over a knot on the tree above the raised bed with the herbs and things. And it's it's doing what... I can only describe as its best impression of like a, you know, a Catherine wheel um, firework. <laughs> yes. It's just, it's absolutely flying around this thing because the wind is so strong, which gives you an idea. I mean, this is a metal trowel. It's really windy. Um, so <laughs> readers, if you do hear well, a weird, podcast. yeah, if you hear a weird um, <sighs> noise uh, in the background of this, of my audio, I do apologize. Um, it's my stupid double glazing, but there we go. <laughs> What is this podcast anymore? This is we were meant to be talking about this athlete, and we've just spent five minutes talking about your fence and the mm-hmm. weather and how. Don't it... take offense at my fence. Oh, this isn't your first offense. Um, oh boy. Okay, I do apologize, dear readers, but you knew what you were signing up for when you listened to this podcast. If this is your Absolutely. first episode, hello. We do actually sometimes talk about Wikipedia, but mostly we it's do. just us being old. Um, so let's actually talk about Wikipedia. Yes. <laughs> at least briefly um so we randomized on jurist sorry 
Juris Silovs. Um, and it has his name right. in Russian here, in, in Cyrillic, uh, which, of course, I can't pronounce because I can't read it. Um, and he, Juris, was a Latvian athlete. I can't talk today. A Latvian athlete from Kraslava. Um, who competed for the Soviet Union from 1970 to 1978, mainly in the 100 meters. Hmm. Uh, and he was rather good, it's got to be said. Uh, he trained at the VSS, uh, which apparently stands for Voluntary Sports Societies of the USSR, doesn't sound like it's voluntary, uh, in Riga, so so modern-day Latvia. Um, Kraslava, incidentally, is seems to be an absolutely tiny town. Um, hang on. It's got its own Wikipedia article. Uh, oh no, no, it's like eight thousand people. Okay, it's like a, it's like it's just not hasn't got a terribly full uh, Wikipedia article. Anyway, um, so uh, Juris um competed for the USSR in the nineteen seventy two Summer Olympics held in Munich. Uh, was that the Munich Olympics? Because that there was the one that Spielberg did the film, but you know there was the Israeli. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, um, inst- yes, it was in the yeah. second week. The sporting nature of the event was largely overshadowed by overshadowed by the Munich massacre in the second week, in which eleven Israeli athletes and coaches and a West German police officer were killed by Black September terrorists from uh, Palestine. So yes, Uh-oh. it was that. It was those Olympics, um, and uh, he competed in the four by one hundred meter relay, where he won the silver medal. With oh god, do you want to know the names of his teammates? Sure, Alexander. Corneliuk Hamilton no, no, no. Uh, Vla- Vladimir Lev- Levetsky and Valery Borzov I'm sure that is exactly how you pronounce all of those names mm. uh, so he won a silver and then he returned four years later at the Summer Olympics in Montreal in the 4x100 and won the bronze with a bunch of other Russian people uh, mm-hmm. sorry Soviet people and also competed at the 1973 Universiad okay what the hell is the Universiad it's a Spanish university, isn't it? It's an international multi-sport event organised for university athletes by the mm-hmm. International University Sports Federation. Um, it's a its name is a combination of the words university and Olympiad. Oh, thanks, Wikipedia. Um, Brilliant. So he took part in that, and he won a bunch of golds. Actually, he won three golds at this summer university. I can't even. I can't talk today. Universidad. Summer university yeah. Ad. yeah. Um, and his well, his personal bests. So hang on, how how. Fast, do you think a guy who... I mean, he's got silver and bronze in the Olympics and the 4x100. Like, what what way would you estimate his personal best, um, like, 100-metre time is? I reckon his 100-metre time was 14 seconds. I feel like you may... I mean, this guy is an Olympian, I'd, <laughs> I'd like to remind you. Um, I think it was 13 seconds. <laughs> 10.33 seconds. Gosh, what a um, speedy boy. Well, I mean, he's a 100-metre sprinter at the Olympics. <laughs> of all the people on planet Earth that you could possibly describe as a speedy boy, he is it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and apparently, But interestingly, it does actually... It, there are three records for his 100 metres. There's 100 metres, 100 metres indoor, which is 10.66 seconds, and then there's 100 metres hand stopwatch. So I could just, just guess less precise and apparently that's 10.1 seconds but then hang on how many people have run less than 10 seconds is a hand stopwatch you literally counting time on your fingers (laughs) one One, two (laughs) three four yeah i reckon that was about four and a half my little finger wasn't quite up so shall we say four yeah let's say four yeah i was i was about to say 10 so i like 9.9 four and a knuckle uh, here we go. Right, so there's a Wikipedia article on the 10 second barrier. Um, so you know, 10, you, you're a truly world class sprinter if you are capable of running less than 10 second. Uh, 100 no, 10 second barrier sounded like another Russian athlete. I thought it sounded like a pretty good um, band name, actually. A 10 second barrier would be a great yeah. band. Uh, so apparently, uh, there have been 137 athletes who have been recorded as running less than 100 meters in less than 10 seconds. This is actually quite a cool Wikipedia article. There are quite a few Brits on here, quite surprisingly. Mm. Um, the first was uh, Jim Hines from uh, the United States of America. He ran oh, he's in- the one who exclusively trained on baked beans. Is that right? Yes. Uh, he had a brand deal, I believe. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, he is the, he's the first person to officially break it. Um, and then the next person was, was someone from Cuba. 
of all actually the first few countries are quite interesting it goes united states cuba united kingdom jamaica namibia kind of an yeah. eclectic mix of uh of of, yeah. of people and I mean, actually what's the oldest the oldest person who's ever run it in less than 10 seconds is australian uh and is called patrick johnson i don't know if you've ever heard of the name good on uh, you patrick and he ran it when he was 30 and 221 days old what a weird thing to say i mean well because you know you're 30 but like the number of days then becomes important um because you know right. all these people who say you're... oh you know but i was like a week older than you so technically i'm the oldest person who's done it um also what's what's interesting here is there's a whole in this, there's a table here um i do love a good table on wikipedia um and there's a little column that allows you to sort for whether uh the people were uh, involved in doping cases um mm. so um apparently actually how many are there who have been involved in doping cases. I'd say probably about a third have been involved in doping cases. Really? One form or another. Yeah. Is Jim Hines clean? Jim Hines is clean. The first doping case was Carl Lewis um, oh. from the United States of America, uh, followed by Linford Christie, who was the Brit. <laughs> oh, dear. Whoops, lol. And then it, of course, has our boy uh, Usain Bolt in here, who's just so far ahead of everybody else. <laughs> Like, no, hang on. What is the 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 best? Right, so he has the best. Uh, his his time was nine fifty eight in two thousand and nine. I have to admit, I have something of an interest in the hundred meter sprint because it's such like there's something compelling about just these tiny incremental increases uh, relative to this this barrier, and then it's just how far below that barrier can you just about reach. Um, mm. So I've, I, find, I have found this kind of cool in the past. So he's at 9.58, and the next uh, best was Tyson Gay from the USA at uh, 9.69. Good effort. So Usain Bolt is more than a tenth of a second faster than anybody else in human history over that uh, distance, which is Gosh. kind of insane. Um, and also... Insane. Off the top, way nice. Uh, off the top, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, three are Jamaican and two are from the USA. And then you know, Jamaica just dominates this. Basically, this mm. is re- this is a really cool article actually. Uh, mm. Apparently, ten people from the United Kingdom have run um, hundred meters in less than ten seconds, compared to fifty-five from the USA, and no one from the Soviet Union. So I don't think we should feel too bad for Juris Silovs for not quite smashing the barrier. Although what's interesting here is uh, I'm not seeing anyone from Russia on this list, but there are two people from China, apparently. Right. I would never have thought that China would be like a sprinting nation, you know? Mm. Uh, and they're both very recent records. Su Bingshan and Xi Jinyi, I think is how you pronounce those. Uh, they seem to be current athletes. Um, but wow, I never, I never would have guessed. Uh, so there we go. That was a nice little diversion. Um, so uh, there is an interesting sort of. So that was his um, Juris's like track record, if you will, uh, if you right. pardon the pun. Uh, and um, you know how like athletes often have quite sad post Olympic lives. Like after they've retired from the sport, they've they, they dedicate their their lives to what they've been doing. It's every minute of every day from like the age of four until the age of twenty five, and then mm-hmm. after that they're done. And you know, it's well, what do I do with my life now? It's said that there's just one very sad sentence here, which contains a bit of a twist. So he retired due to trauma in nineteen seventy eight. So he was right uh, twenty eight, comma. Later becoming a catering entrepreneur. Fair play. Uh, not, <laughs> not a career move that I would have ever expected uh, mm. from an Olympic sprinter. I guess that he got the meals there quickly. That is the only, like, if that would be his, his unique selling point. <laughs> yeah. Like, if you live 100 meters away, I can get this meal to you in just over 10 seconds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as long as you don't mind it being smashed to s. Well, uh, there you go, kids. That's a. Uh... If, if there's a lesson to be learned, mm. there there is one there. <laughs> it's just I always I, I I do find it very sad that like these people get their moment in the sun, and you know if you if you don't win a medal, then it well I'm not saying it's all for nothing. Like you can still set national records, you can still be proud of yourself and everything like that. But um, you know that after that, then your life has just burned out. You've just burned twice as fast. Mm. Uh, your candle is twice as bright in a bit. It burns half as long. Um, mm. and you know you see these. I'm just gonna 
I've been told this, and I never actually checked this myself. If you apparently, if you go on eBay and search for Olympic gold medal, there are loads of people who are selling their medals to try and you know get by. Really? Um, yeah, there are there are some. I mean, most of these appear to be replicas or um, uh, like pictures of people with their medals and things. But there are a couple on here who are seem to be legit. I never actually used mm. eBay. Have you bought anything from eBay? Yeah. What have you bought? I've bought uh, a couple of months ago. I bought a dressing gown. I mean, again, I'm an old You're man. So old. I mean, <laughs> yeah, You're so I was, old. Dad. I bought a dressing. Do you know what's? Do you know what's worse? Mm. I was on Etsy yesterday. And do you know what I bought from Etsy? Go on. Hang on, I need to find it because I need to read out exactly what the listed item is because it is embarrassing. <laughs> um, so it's about eight thirty in the morning. I've been doing a bit of doing a bit of reading, um, just generally kind of faffing about on uh, on the interwebs. Mm-hmm. Made a cup of tea, and I'm immediately thinking, mm, I just I like making a pot of tea, but it it's gone a bit cold quite quickly. Actually, I mean half an hour. I wish I had a I wish I had something to keep it warm. And then as that started, the half an hour procrastination. Uh, which was me going on to Etsy and Amazon and basically all over scouring the internet for um, a nice tea cosy. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah. So what did I find? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I'm going to find the email, the confirmation email now. And ooh, I think it's somewhere here. Let's see. There you are. Oh, maybe I didn't order it. <laughs> oh, no. Annoying. Did you I not thought I order did. it? Oh, I really no. liked it. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Anyway, anyway basically, um, it's a, it's an organic wool, <laughs> hand knitted tea cozy in the shape of a beehive with little bees on it, and it's bloody lovely. Good lord, man! I know <laughs> like... it's so nice. I mean, I say this. My mum um, knitted. Oh, I found it. No, I found it. I have got it. I have got it. Okay. Um, I think my mum either knitted or was gifted a knitted. Uh, tea cozy in the shape of Yoda. Um, That's awesome. Because my mum's just the best. Um, yeah, <laughs> like I'm, I, I can't remember. I wish I, I wish I could. I could remember what what she actually um, uh, what the story was. But yeah, she she's. I mean, you've met my parents. They're just a little bit like that, really. Especially my mum, just a little bit wacky. Um, apart from the fact that my dad, I think, managed to break it because he put the spout of the teapot where Yoda's dick would be. Um, and like Strong. rammed it on that way. So there we go. If anyone's wondering why I am the way I am, um, this is why. Uh, because of the family that I come from. I don't think they listen to this. I really hope they don't, or I'm about to get an earful from my parents. So I say about to, as if they're about to like call me, being like, "We heard what you were saying. We heard yeah. you were chatting. Shit. <laughs> get back here this minute." <laughs> don't know why my parents are no, dying, um, but there we go. The uh, the person who's made this tea cozy. <laughs> I don't want to go back to this marvellous tea cozy, but I'm going to. Um, her name is Daisy. She's the owner of Cotswold Craft Cottage. Of course. In Sirencester, England. Uh, thank you for buying from Cotswold Craft Cottage. We hope you enjoy your purchase. The They've gone to the trouble of tell, reminding you that, yes, it is, in, in fact, organic wool. Um, and uh, it's apparently the wool of a local sheep in the village. Does it give the I'm name sure of the email. sheep? No, I wish they did. I want them to be like, it's um, the wall is from Malcolm. Um, Malcolm is mm. uh, is uh, sixteen years old. He, you know, you know, we joke. Old. We joke. How old is an old sheep? I have no idea. I have friends who'd be able to tell me, but I have no idea. My dad would probably be able to tell me. You know, you joke about not having, um, not knowing the name. There was a place. It was a farm shop at Farringdon Gurney. Um, near where mm. proper home and it would tell you the name of the cow that your meat came from like it would literally say on the side of your pie or whatever it was like wh- wh- where this meat came from mm. um, it was qu- quite something uh, it was very wet 10 to 12 years they lived for 10 to 12 years is that in captivity or just in general that is the lifespan of a sheep domestic sheep okay yeah there we go that's sheep, all that I'm problem on... <laughs> I'm on Sheep 101, basic information about sheep. The life expectancy of a sheep is similar to a large breed of dog. What is this podcast? It is just going off the rails. 
Oh my god. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, before we move on into Critics Corner, because there's a couple of things that I'd like to critique, um, have you heard the news about uh, YogCon? No, I think I did see a sign for it somewhere, yeah. Yeah, so the Yogs cast are doing their own convention in Bristol. Uh, which I will Gosh. hopefully be going to. I don't know if you... Uh, I'll have to... Hang on. Sorry, I've got a million tabs open because I was just looking up uh, 40k terrain uh, on uh, eBay. What is I, this podcast? Um, YogCon. Here we go. What are the dates? Uh, it is, for those of you who may be interested in attending, between the 3rd and 4th of August this year. Um, oh, cool. And uh, I will... Well, hopefully I'll be going. I mean, apparently I can sign up somewhere about being like a... Um, you know, a, a creator as, as part of mm-hmm. it because, you know, I've done stuff with them and hopefully I'll be doing some more stuff very soon. Um, but I, yeah, I will be going. I know that several people in the community are big fans of the Oxcast, so um, it'd be great to meet some of you there. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Just I don't, would you, Do you think you'd be tempted to go, Dan, meet everybody? Yeah, I think I would be. I think it'd be really fun, actually, because Bristol's just a great city anyway. In summer, it's like Bristol in summer, loads to do. It's gorgeous. And get to meet all these really... Because that's the thing about the Oxcast is having now spent a fair bit of time at the the studios and everything and meeting everybody, they're just genuinely lovely people. They're Mm. so genuine. You know, who you see in the videos is who you see in real life. Um, So I am very much looking forward to... um, uh, to that and yeah hopefully meeting a bunch of people but i'll pop i'll pop a link in the description um sorry to, uh, to the show notes uh if people are interested in that and maybe you'll be able to meet dan and i and some people from the ox cast but you know who cares about them really um but dan i would like you now to tell me about your piece of the week <laughs> And this will be my piece of the week. Drum roll, please. My, uh, for, for, for those who, who may cast your minds back to last week's episode, I mentioned that I was off to London uh, on Monday for an audition on Tuesday um, for the Genesis 16 programme, which is a um, kind of a scholar programme run by the Choir of the 16. Um, I had to prepare two set pieces off a list um, uh, prescribed for if you're a tenor, you go to the tenor section, obviously. Um, and then one of my own choice. Now, my two set pieces were Where Are You Walk uh, from uh, by Handel. Semel- from, Semel- is it Semel? I'm not yeah. sure how you pronounce it, but yes, nice. Um, and Purcell, I'll Sail Upon the Dog Star. I don't know that one. No, it's very odd. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of um, pompy um foppish dandy of a song sounds um, perfect for you <laughs> well yeah i mean it was quite a good it was quite it was quite jolly to sing however i think i would have i would have much preferred to have sung the handle but when i went into my audition rather than doing the two set pieces and my own choice they just said right we'll only, we'll only hear one of the set pieces and then we'll do your own choice and sod's law i did the one that i would have preferred not to have done which was the um sail upon the dog star but i think it went all right um what I, I did do, however, um, was a really lovely French piece, and I haven't sung it in French before, and it's really quite fun, um, called Le Exquise, which I think translates loosely to like the perfect hour. Oh, the exquisite hour um, or something like that. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I think I've heard By of this. Ronaldo Han, H A H N. And I'm going to make that my choral piece of the week, actually. It's not really choral in the sense that it's a solo, um, but there's a really lovely, really lovely recording by a tenor called Ben Bliss on YouTube. Um, highly recommend it. It's really, really sweet. Um, very, very quiet. And the kind of music that I like to sing, I'm as much as I enjoyed singing the Handel, the Purcell's quite operatic. And while it's fun to sing in a kind of big loud dramatic way i much prefer doing more kind of quiet introspective minimalist stuff um and this hand piece was lovely um so yeah that's my choral piece of the week but the audition i think went really well um, yeah can you can you talk a little bit about how, what what you did then how you think it went so i feel like this yeah. is probably the best corner for this to go in yeah absolutely so i let's let's cast our minds back to monday so the Monday was the day I was going to travel up. I was going to stay in London for the evening and then I would have my audition on the Tuesday morning. So I woke up bright and early, um, did a bit of a warm up at home, then legged it to campus where I had a last minute singing lesson with my singing teacher, Tim Murphin, who's a fantastic professional bass 
soloist down here in the southwest. Big um, voice, very very big voice. Yeah, he's an incredible teacher. Anyway, so I had a lesson with him, which culminated with us realizing that the room we'd booked had been locked from the inside. So we had to run around the side of Cornwall House and both climb in through the window, which is quite a good way to start an audition, I think, in terms of keeping <laughs> you calm. Um, so we both uh, we both climbed through there, did the lesson, that went fine. Um, I then ran to the forum and did some last minute printing of music because I was like, well, maybe I should just do some extra copies in case something goes wrong or they don't have something or, you know, mm. in the audition, that is. I then went home, had some soup in a sandwich and got on a train. Uh, the train took me into London Paddington from Exeter St. David's. And I from there went to Blackfriars and took an Uber, which was my first Uber. Um, I've only taken like one, I think. So, you know, I'm, yeah. I, what, what was your, no, let's not review the Uber. <laughs> this is yeah. getting ridiculous now. Um, uh, and I then was staying with um, uh, some family friends in uh, in London for that evening, which was very chill, very quiet. I got there at about six o'clock in the evening, so I had enough time to kind of have some dinner and get a really good night's sleep, um, which I did for the most part. Then the following morning, um, the the family I was staying with had all kind of disappeared off, so I had the house to myself, which was lovely because it's always nicer warming up and kind of warming the voice on your own rather than yeah. kind of consciously kind of trying to hold back slightly because you don't want to deafen people or be embarrassed or whatever. So um, did some warm ups there. Then slowly made my way into Trafalgar Square because my audition was at St. Martin in the Fields, um, which was, it's a, incidentally, a really, really lovely church. Um, but the audition was down in kind of, you had to go in via the crypt and then Ooh. there's this whole massive sprawling underground space with all these kind of conference rooms and recital rooms and everything. Um, from there, I was signed in by a, a lovely lady called Jess, who's the manager for Genesis 16 did some kind of like admin and then was shown to the warm up room and we were you were there for 10 minutes should you wanted to, if you wanted to use it otherwise you could just kind of sit in there and wait and then after 10 minutes they said right we're ready for you now so i brought my little folder of music and went in and the room itself was bizarre so you kind of walked along um a kind of gallery to your left there was a solid wall and to your right there was a glass wall and you kind of looked into this big, big um fishbowl of a room and down in the bottom imagine you know the scene in harry potter and the order of the phoenix yeah when um they ha they go to the ministry of magic and they go yeah. into that courtroom and there's oh, yeah. kind of there's yeah, lots yeah, yeah. of steps that kind of vault down into this big so you can kind of see from everywhere anyway there was this big glass walled room and there were two, the two Genesis people on the panel. So that was the wife of one of the conduct, Eamon, the conductor, and a tenor. Um, and then there was a guy in the corner at a grand piano. And then you stood in the centre of this room, in the centre of this big glass room with kind of people walking around. It was completely soundproof, but it was quite daunting because people were just walking around around you. And they were like, hi, uh, tell us a bit about yourself. What are you singing? All right, go and sing it. Okay, sing your next piece. We'll ask you a couple more questions, and then that was it, really. Was it a very in there was intimidating no... atmosphere then? Like, did they try it and make you feel at ease? No, I think they did. They did. They did a really good job at, at kind of like they want. They want you to do as well as you can. So I think they were. They were. They were. You know, they were certainly very friendly. But I think the room itself is quite daunting because um, it is just so exposed. You feel very exposed. But yeah, I think it. I think the pieces went well. The accompanist was really good. Um, I think I. Played to my strengths in choosing a quite a, um, as I say, introspective own choice piece, which also helps the accompanist because it's really, really minimal, as as uh, readers will be able to hear when they listen to the choral piece of the week. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it all went really well. I had more of a chat with them about what I was up to. I mentioned that I was also going to apply for the conducting scholar place as well, um, which is good. And they said, oh, that's handy. It's good that you've auditioned as well, because usually the conducting scholar also sings with the choir but that that audition won't be for, for quite a bit later and then they said yeah you'll you'll find out toward the end of april thanks very much for coming um see you in a bit i was like, okay so left off and then flew back to paddington as quick as i could because i had to be back in exeter for even song that day so it was a bit of a um bit of a stress but i think it went really nicely i do i've got really mixed feelings about london just generally i think there's parts of it that I think, oh, I really like London. I could really definitely be here. And then there's also parts of me that go, gosh, it's really quite massive, isn't it? And sprawling and just That's more manic. the feeling I, I get. I feel like I'm always yeah. too small and not important enough to be in London. 
Um, yeah. Probably didn't help that the last time I was there I was at the Royal Institution. And um, mm. like that's right in the very rich bit of... I, I literally walked past a shop which had gold bullion in its window. Mm-hmm. Um, like I, you know, it, it, the center of London is just another world of money. Um, yeah, it's it's outrageous, and I always feel very out of place. I know exactly what you mean. We are just like I don't know how. Maybe it's the maybe it's people feel entitled if you grow up from like a very young age and you feel like that's where you're supposed to be because it's where your dad and mum works. Then it's not mm-hmm. so bad, but yeah, it's it's bizarre to me. <laughs> but there you go. I think it all went. Pretty well. Well, it they was didn't an interesting just laugh experience. At you. you know, they they didn't like stop you mid song uh, because they were laughing so hard. So I feel yeah, like- and so sorry. <laughs> this is a singing audition. What are you What are you doing? You You're just kind of screaming at us. Um, <laughs> Put your know, clothes it, it back all- on and stop yeah. screaming. <laughs> Why? Why have you brought that leather sofa with you? What's going? on? Imagine I'm here for my casting. Um, yeah. Imagine if you just whip your if you wore like tear away trousers, you just rip your clothes off and just start screaming at the top of your lungs. Yeah. And they'd be like, ah, true tenor talent. What? Yeah, real tenor. Look at him go. <laughs> You've done Gilbert and Sullivan, I see. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Anyway, well, actually, that leads us neatly on to something I wanted to just talk about in the next corner. <laughs> so, Dan, I would like to talk about Umbrella Academy. I have mm, I have been okay. watching this. So you brought this up last time. This is the, I did. Um, you half watched the first episode. Have you caught up a little bit with it then? Not really. Oh, sorry. The way you were talking about it I've, earlier implied I've, I've that kind you, of, you would... I've watched. I've watched bits because, as I say, as I said last week, my housemate has been watching them. But since then, I've been so preoccupied with this audition and just busy. I haven't really. I haven't watched anything on the mm. TV. Um, but uh, from what I've seen of it, I'm really keen to properly sit down and watch it because it does look quite interesting. So, Pixel Girl and I have been watching it together, and unusually for something that I like, she seems to really like it. Um, Mm -hmm. and we've been talking about it and like discussing theories and and all this kind of thing Um, and and it's it's really good I I like uh, based on your recommendation from last time we gave it a go and uh, I would can wholeheartedly recommend it to the uh, Wikicast readership Uh, if you like it's probably the closest analogue I can think of is something like Stranger Things in that it is a hard but not completely hard sci-fi um, mm-hmm. It feels very grounded, but there's also elements of fantastical in there. In that there is literally a talking chimpanzee that acts as a butler. Um, yes, uh, which is you know, so there there are elements of it that you that are kind of fantasy, but it's definitely more on the sci-fi side of things with a bunch of time travel and sort of superpowers and things like that. A few interesting things though, which I'd like to to bring up. One, do you know who wrote the comic book that it's based on? I have no idea. The comic, so I didn't, uh, for one thing, I didn't realise at first that it was based off a comic. It was based off a comic that was written by Gerard Way. Now, does that name seem familiar to you? It does seem familiar to me, yeah. He is the lead singer of My Chemical Romance. Really? Yeah! Like, and I, I thought that it maybe it was someone that's... with the same name, but no, it's the same dude. Uh, that, that, that's bizarre. That Gerard Way. And he seems, he just seems to be a really interesting guy. Yeah. Um, I, um, hang on, because I googled him. The other day, um, like as a as a just because it's not even like he co-wrote it and the, you know they're tr- cashing on in his celebrity. He just wrote it, um, mm. and he also um, wrote another series called "The True Lives of the Fa- Fabulous Killjoys." Um, he's also had a debut album, which I didn't know about. But yeah, just f- totally out of left field. I was like, yeah. wait, th- that. Gerard Way? <laughs> and, That's incredible. Uh, yeah, so there's that. The other thing, uh, which Pixel Girl and I cannot stop noticing in the show, um, for one thing, all of the performances are great. Um, yeah. And like the, the casting is, is pretty spot on, really. Apart from the voice of the butler of Pogo is like really not doesn't match the visuals at all but um the, probably the best performance of the whole lot is the guy playing klaus who is one of the orphans so each orphan um in the series has uh, an ability like they all have superpowers apart from number seven um and number five klaus's ability is that he can talk to dead people um he can just convene with the dead uh, and talk to talk to them as if they were just there in the room with them and 
we can't escape how much the character is like our friend Ed Dunn. Yeah, I, this is one of the first things I said when I watched it. <laughs> like, I said to James, it's Ed. <laughs> literally, if people want to get a glimpse into what Life Inside Chapel Choir was like when Dan and I were both in it, our friend Ed is Klaus from this show. And I can't, like, it's not even like we're saying he looks like him, which he does. He acts like yeah. him. The character is Ed. <laughs> it's just we can't get over it it's crazy um he's just such a at one point he's being tortured by uh some people and they're strangling him and they notice that it's pointless carrying on because he's just popped a, an erection from the asphyxiation and we yeah. look, basically and i just looked at each other and we were like ed yep cool yeah. that's ed um yeah. It's just so funny. I just we love it. it it's and just, the dress it, sense and yeah, it's yeah the dress it? sense. The fact that it's like all gothic and then he's got this little little frilly pink umbrella and the way that he acts and he, the fact that he's just <laughs> the fact that he's f- insane. Um, I love him. I, I I love the character and Ed to bits. Um, yeah. So a high, a wholehearted recommendation, especially if you if you're interested in uh, what our lives were like in Exeter, definitely watch it. But yeah, I you should like you, it. You should catch up with it. Um, we're on episode four, I think now. Um, it's very cool. good. Very, very much enjoying yeah. it. Um, have you been watching? So you said you've been very busy. Have you been watching or reading anything recently? Um, I was having more of a read of the. Um, I saw Eternity the other night. I think I mentioned this a long time ago, toward Christmas. The book about the history of English choral music and the ah yes, with, with specific reference to King's College, Cambridge. Um, yeah, I, I took that with me on the bus. On the bus on the train um, when I was in London, which was quite pleasant. Um, I have been listening to a new podcast. Oh, you traitorous whore. Go on. Yeah, I know. Um, The podcast is done by uh, The Economist, Mm -hmm. and it's called uh, The Intelligence. Ah, okay. I've not heard of this. It's really interesting. So basically what it does, you get a new episode every day, and it summarizes the key key piece of news in the media. So, Mm. for instance, today's episode is called Lights Out, Venezuela's Blackout. Power cuts in Caracas have endangered lives and deepened the misery of Venezuela. And it's talking about why that's happening. Yesterday's episode was about Brexit. The the day before was about Boeing. Um, uh, The one on Friday, Algeria's protests. It's really it's really good podcast. So Um, how how long are the episodes? About 25 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes. Okay, so they're moderately deep dives. Yeah, on on an individual topic. Oh, that's interesting. I have to admit, I am just sick to death of hearing about everything at the moment. I, I yeah. am just exhausted, especially given that w- the alarm that we wake up to now is we actually listen to Radio Five Live, which is surprisingly good political commentary. Like it seems to be, from where we're standing at least, quite impartial, um, yeah. and you know, no nonsense. Um, it's so- you know, Five Live is good when it's the it's the home of Kermode and Mayo. Of and uh, Mayo, yeah. Uh, so yes, that is true. Um, but uh, yeah, so but it's the first thing I hear about in the morning, and it's often the last thing I hear about at night. I'm just so desperately tired of everything. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, let's wait for this whole silly referendum to, to blow over, uh, yeah. and then I, maybe I'll, I'll tune back into the world, uh, which is a terribly close-minded way of thinking about things. But I just can't, guys. I, I apologize, but I just. I can't anymore. I'm yeah. so tired. No, I think that's that is exactly the kind of the kind of disillusion and disinterest that base that the most most of the kind of the majority of the population are feeling at the moment. Everyone's just like, oh, you know what? Everyone okay. is is that um, that woman from Bristol? Do you remember when they were, the, um, yeah. they were talking about having the ref? Oh, uh, not again! You're another joking. Another one. Oh, yeah. this is ridiculous. I can't be keeping up with this. Yeah. <laughs> like, everyone, they're like, we're voting on Theresa May's deal again? But, like, yeah. we've already, but it would be undemocratic for us to have a second vote. Like, let's not be ridiculous here. Ugh. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, okay, but that's interesting. I'm not, I, I actually, um, I haven't listened to it yet, um, but uh, our friend Tom Zalatni, who came onto the show a little while ago, mm-hmm. um, we do, uh, we, we really should get another guest on at some point. Um, yeah, I, I think I think it'd be fun. Um, uh, he has launched a new podcast called Blasting Off Again, which is going through the Pokemon anime series from the beginning and like watching it with a guest every time. I think. Um, oh, I cool. I haven't listened to it yet, but it's a really really cool idea, and I really like Tom. Um, so. I've always thought about that actually because I've really wanted to properly have, and I, I'm a, I'll do this post graduation. I imagine just take take a weekend uh, where I'm not doing anything at all and just sit and bulk watch like all of the avatar 
um, oh, yeah, series because yeah. um, I I love the Last Airbender Avatar, not Blue Monkey's Avatar. I really I really I used to get into it because it used to be on after school, but I never I've never properly kind of watched it as a back to back. You know, watching it following the story properly. You know, because the, oh, like, the way that's shown yeah. on TV is like you get like season three episode four and then season seven episode two, and that was me and um, Stargate. Whenever, whenever I watched Stargate uh, as a kid, it was on Channel 4 and it seemed to be just completely random order. Like, yeah. just totally. Although actually, ah, yeah, that's, 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 that's true. Um, what I've been watching recently is Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, which is on Netflix. And mm-hmm. oh my God, Dan, it is, it, they don't, make them like that anymore like the the, mm. the as in the uk system of tv has changed but it is just i haven't seen a tv show like actually handle sci-fi in an intelligent way like mm-hmm. tng has i don't think ever since i mean feel i would love to get some recommendations for this guys if people want to email in um but in terms of a new episode every week dealing with a new issue like um the, i watched elementary my dear data recently which was about basically when what is sentience can a mm-hmm. holographic projection uh imbued with enough intelligence claim to be sentient um mm-hmm. and and you know it held the enterprise ransom uh, and said, you know, it would destroy the ship if it wasn't allowed. I to can't do that, Dave. That kind of thing, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Except it's Moriarty from uh, Sherlock Holmes. They do a simulation to test Commander Data, and they make Moriarty too powerful, and he works out that he's in a simulation and mm-hmm. um, that he's on a starship, and you know, holds the ship to ransom. It's such a clever episode. And then I did watch another one yesterday that was about Data, the android, trying to understand what is humor, mm-hmm. whilst the Enterprise is uh, mitigating like a, um, a diplomatic feud between two planets and it's just ah it's so good it's on netflix this is and- this is patrick stewart next generation yes uh, yeah. that one um and it, you know because i watched it as a kid and i never watched it in order i never really had any semblance of the storyline um so i'm actually going through now and for some reason season one isn't on netflix anymore but i think season one was meant to be the weakest season anyway so it's a bit like you know the early simpsons um so the next generation yeah i, I think I, I remember reading that at some point because that it's, was a it's season... on. I'm just looking now, and it's on. What uh, for season one is on Netflix. Yeah. No. Oh, it's got Star Trek Next Generation seasons one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hang on, I'm going to have to have a look at this uh, because I, I I was watching it before. Oh God, sorry, it's doing that thing that uh, it's auto playing. Oh yeah, it's coming. It wasn't coming up the other day. Hmm. Wow, I got most of the way through season one um, because that was the season that Gene Roddenberry still had a uh, an influence on, and. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's changed quite a bit going into season two. How many more episodes have I got? Oh boy, just looking at the quality though, the quality is definitely worse than season one. <laughs> like the production value is definitely lower. Um, but mm. yeah, I, I'm now I'm really enjoying going through that, you know, properly. Um, mm. So um, yeah, would uh, would recommend that to people if people haven't heard of Star Trek: The Next Generation. You should watch it. <laughs> it's really good. Um, but yeah, th- so that was that was the podcast that I was going back to. It, that was uh, Tom. I'll put a link to that as well. Blasting off again, um, which yeah looks looks really really good. Um, cool. There was an- another thing. Oh yeah, have you heard about all of the drama on YouTube to do with in a nutshell? Nope. Right. So let's just uh, uh, get get this up. I want to make sure I get this right because um, basically, um, there's in a nutshell, Kurtz gesagt. Um, which is this fantastic YouTube channel that does educational content. It takes months to make each episode. It's like a team of 30 people. It's like super high quality, like c- closing in on 10 million subscribers. And they did mm-hmm. a video recently uh, where they basically asked, can you trust Kurtz Gesagt? And we said, they said that they pulled down two of their most popular videos because they weren't happy with the quality of those videos anymore. Um, mm. And so they sort of did this video saying, right, we weren't happy. This is why we weren't happy this is our research process and this is how, you know, if you want to know, can you trust us? This is how we do it, basically. And um, a couple of days after that, it was two days ago as the time of recording, um, another channel called Coffee Break, who is a big channel, like it's several hundred thousand subscribers, um, despite the fact mm-hmm. they claim that they are a small channel, which is, I mean, they're small relative to Kurzgesagt, but like, it's kind of laughable to claim that if you're a third of a million subs that you are somehow small. Yeah. Uh, they made a video basically saying, can you trust Kurzgesagt? Um, and saying that they emailed them with a list of questions about the videos, one of the videos they pulled down, which was about addiction. And they've, they basically, you know, in their video said, well, it's just sort of suspicious that they 
put off answering our questions in an interview until March. And then before we had a chance to interview, they then published a video sniping all of the things which we've said and claiming they did it off their own volition. Mm. Which, you know, looks suspicious on the surface. But then when you think about it, what they're actually complaining about is, oh, well, they fixed the problem, Mm -hmm. but just not in the way that I wanted them to fix the problem. Uh, And then there was like some, there was, I'll leave it to people to find on their own, but there was just a lot of controversy to do with the fact that like, they then released the emails, which was also a bit trigger, like, was it dog whistling? Where he had, like, released the emails in their video and, like, a picture of Hillary. And I was a bit just mm-hmm. like, why would you do that? Anyway. Why would you um, do that, yeah. And, um, you know, since the emails have come out, everyone's going, yeah, coffee break, you kind of messed up here. You you have been pretty unfair of how you've represented Kurtzkasach. And it's just quite funny, really, because they, uh, in his video, he says that, like, oh, yeah, and Philip from Kurtzkasach owns the YouTube mafia uh, and then put up a picture of Standard, uh, which is the network that I'm part of. And it's like, we're now apparently referred to as the smart YouTube mafia, um, which is just hilarious. <laughs> like, if anything, we don't get paid by Philip. If anything, we pay him by, the, like, mm-hmm. the agency taking a cut from our earnings um it's just for, like everybody's like been changing their twitter handles and stuff i saw my favorite thing was Lindsay ellis on twitter someone replied to her after she put up like a picture of goodfellas with like oh look it's the smart youtube mafia his real engineering and and um wendover and all these people and someone was replying to it like hey i'm analyzing here <laughs> um, just like it's just such a laughable controversy, but uh, if people aren't aware, that that's a thing that's happening, and it seems to be a whole lot of fuss over nothing. So there we go. That That's a thing Gosh. that's happening in the world of YouTube. Anyway, we have been going for a while. Should we pop on over to Patreon Corner? Top lad! So it's that time again where we'd like to say a massive thank you to our supporters on Patreon. You can find our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the wikicast. Um, this is the part of the podcast where we'd like to say a, just a, a huge thank you to, to those who support us, really. Um, the support goes an incredibly long way. You yeah, you, you give possible. us funding, you aid us in our donations to the Wikimedia Foundation, um, various other little projects that Simon and I have that might have been merch that might be going to see each other to do a to do a video in person. Um, and that... let's not forget the Wikicast fan animation contest, which is currently Absolutely. ongoing. There'll be a link in the show notes. Do check it out. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's all of your kind of your your, your hard work. Um, that's that's both thanking our, our top lads and uh, Team Cat and Dog, um, which will be changing next week, I believe, as we as we said last week. But first, a thank you to our top lads. So I would like to say a huge thank you to Ben McMurtry, Bryce D Wilkins, and Choco Cat. Thank you very much to Cole Mansfield, Dan Hanvey, and Davy Shram Vontabel, Devon Hill, Eric Davis, and Henry Brewster. Isabel Ostrowski, Jay Wright, John Mannion, John Selway, Jonathan Trimble, and Jordi Eschendal, Kyle Much, Luckland Woods, Lewis Watson, Maggie Marutvakira Punyuat, and Matt Maguire, Oliver Burkhart, that's a new one, and I've, I've definitely mangled that pronunciation. <laughs> Oliver Burkhart, I'm going to stick with that, why not? Smooth. Omar Miranda, and Fee Gascoigne, Rory Healy, Tapio Kirkinen, Tristan, and Whitney Fairies. Ah, oh, you guys are the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You are. You, not only do you help us, remember, you are at, you are p- pooling your efforts together and helping Wikimedia. Um, mm-hmm. If we can get up to two hundred dollars a month on the Patreon, that covers our hosting and um, stuff like investing into the uh, animation contest, so we can help support creativity in the community. But also, if we get to two hundred bucks a month, we will up our support from Wikimedia from the current twenty pounds a month to fifty pounds a month. That's a huge mm-hmm. donation that we can make to help human knowledge. Um, because when was the last time you donated to Wikipedia, right? So if you you haven't for a while, donate to us and we'll do a big donation on everybody's behalf. Top lad! Before we nip on over into Correspondence Corner, we actually have some follow-up from uh, last week's Crisis Corner. So this last week's Crisis Corner, if you remember, uh, was somebody uh, thinking of applying for a PhD. They didn't want to do it with their current supervisor. They were worried about the prospect of um, basically telling their supervisor they didn't really want to work with them. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, you know, losing out on a potentially good place. Um, so the, we have a, a, an email here from another anonymous um, who is aged 238,252.3 three micro centuries i like that i like that a lot um and and anonymous right so i'll just I'll, let's just read this out and then we'll move on into correspondence but i i feel like they put a lot of thought into this so let's mm. you know let's air this um anonymous writes dear simone and pumba <laughs> nice 
How, have, how has nobody done that yet? That's that's great. Um, I'd like to go anonymous here and offer my tuppence on Anonymous's PhD crisis that you read out in the newly released episode. I'm about four months into a PhD with the same supervisor at the same university that I did my master's at. I began my master's thesis work in late 2017, having already done a few months of work in the same lab over that summer, and soon afterwards I started thinking about PhDs. My initial thoughts went to other labs in other universities, in other countries, like my native country, but that's another story, because I felt that that was the natural progression, to constantly be moving on to new places. I was open with my supervisor about this, and she was happy to write references for me. At the same time, there were little hints and comments from my supervisor about continuing a PhD with her. In the middle of my various applications in spring 2018, the offer to stay and continue my master's work into a PhD became more upfront, to the point of having actual discussions about the details. So this is actually quite similar to um, the situation that I was in, in that I had the offer to do a PhD at Oxford, which I actually accepted and then couldn't take up. Um, so interesting parallels there, actually. Um, Anonymous continues. Although it was a little awkward, I basically said, thanks for the offer and I'll bear it in mind, but I'll also continue with all my planned applications to keep my options open before making a final decision. In the end, those other applications didn't pan out and I accepted the offer to stay where I was. Now, half a year down the line, I'm very happy with that outcome, but also glad that I tried out other options first. My supervisor wasn't put off or offended that I didn't immediately jump at her offer because I think she understood that some people have broad interests and want to give themselves as many options as possible before making a decision as weighty as where and what topic to do their PhD in. The PhD will largely define the direction of your whole career, so you have to choose really wisely. It may vary from academic to academic, but I'd like to think that most supervisors worth their salt should also understand this. This is all a long-winded way of saying to Anonymous, be honest with your supervisor and say that you want to keep your options open. If they are a supervisor worth having, then they should understand that and accept your decision without bearing a grudge that would harm your future applications. This is complicated by the fact that the future offer would interrupt your integrated masters. And to be honest, I think it's also fair enough to say, I want to see this through to the end before starting a PhD if that's what you want. The master's taught me a lot, so it's worth completing even if you already have a PhD offer, and especially if you're not sure that the PhD offer is right for you. Good luck, best anonymous. That's some great advice, I think, from anonymous. Um, mm, that I think the point actually about the fact that if they're a supervisor worth having, then they should be willing to, you know, be patient with the fact that you're applying to other places and you want to consider other universities. I, that That's an excellent point, really. Um, and I just, uh, I hope that that is helpful to you. Uh, pr- initial anonymous, anonymous primus, uh, anonymous sec- secundus' um, advice here, I think is excellent. So thank you very mm. much for emailing in. If you find yourself in crisis, dear viewer, and uh, you would, viewer, reader, and you would like to uh, have our expert wisdom weigh in on it, it could be a serious crisis or it could be a not so serious crisis, um, do send it into spongyelectricgmail.com with crisis corner in the subject line and we will anonymize everything that's sent to that uh, email. I'm quite surprised we haven't had more sexual crises, to be honest, Dan. Seeing as it's anonymous, I thought the people who'd be writing it about, you know, sexual mm. activity-related accidents, or Sarah, as we call them in the industry. But uh, mm. there we go. Maybe they all are, but they're just misspelling the uh, misspelling, misspelling the email. <laughs> Another podcast who's uh, spongy and electric. Um, oh, there's, a, there's yeah. a, actually blasting off again is getting all these weird emails about... Yeah. So how yeah. do I get something that doesn't have a flange out of my anus? Yeah. That's a rookie mistake rookie we have another piece of correspondence here um from james mumford who's a, a regular a regular writer in ah. and, uh, and reader of the podcast he mm. says afternoon gents having heard your recent discussion regarding the oscars and elation with black panther's nomination and win for best score i feel compelled to speak out on behalf of a film i was gro- that was grossly overlooked if beale street could talk follows tish and Fonny, a young black couple in the 19 in 1970s new york and while centrally a tragic love story features Fonny's discrimination set up and wrongful conviction the story is awful though and it's making uh making lies in the most painfully heartbreaking score I've ever heard. Truthfully, I implore all readers to listen to the soundtrack on Spotify, even in failing to see the film. If your time is limited, and it is, listen to these three tracks in particular to get a flavour. Eden, brackets, Harlem, Agape, and Eros. Please do yourself a favour and listen. Also, cry. Crying is good. It is good. Your faithful reader, James Mumford. P.S. I saw the film on my 20th birthday and cried three times in the theatre, hence why it's so close to my heart. Thank you, James, for that uh, Great recommendation. That tip. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to admit, I, I, I've just Googled it and I, I recognised the poster. Um, it didn't impact on my consciousness whatsoever, but I will have to, um, I will definitely listen to the score. Wow. Because it, it has been nominated for quite a few a mm. few awards. It was nominated for a bunch of Golden Globes and um, Critics' Choice Awards. 
And uh, apparently it was nominated for Cinema for Peace, Most Valuable Film of the Year, 2019. I've never heard of wow. Cinema for Peace before. But yeah, I'll have to give a listen to that. Good recommendation. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you. We now have an email from uh, <laughs> Neil, I believe. Uh, I mean, they've signed off as a sad young man who's fed up of telling people he doesn't like my chemical romance or Green Day. Um and, and they write, Dear Clark, for some reason in much larger font, uh, it's actually Comic Sans and Yellow uh, and more, I'm very far behind on your fantastic and large font, bold, underlined, incredibly professional podcast. So I'm assuming that Correspondence Corner still exists and the episodes haven't just become an hour and a half of erotic literature. Uh, well, uh, you're kind of yeah. right. Um, Steady. This, this morning, I was reading episode 17 of the podcast on the album I'll Be the Tornado by Dads. Do you remember this episode? Oh, yeah. Classic. On behalf of all plaid shirt wearing hipster crybabies around the world, I would plaid. like to make a. Is it plaid? I've plaid. never heard it out loud before. Oh, okay. Uh, plaid shirt wearing hipster crybabies across the world. I would like to make a point about the genre of emo. So I thought this was interesting because we actually talked about emo last week and we will get mm. on, I think, uh, in a bit to the some of the preliminary results of the music um, survey that you uh, called for last week. Indeed. Uh, which is still ongoing, of course. We're, we're still receiving emails. Um, but yeah, yeah. so uh, Neil continues. Bands that are popularly known as emo are part of the third wave of the genre. Right. Uh, this is essentially pop punk that sad people wearing eyeliner managed to make even more cringeworthy. Well, two- okay. The two preceding waves before this were related only in name. The first wave in the 80s was essentially punk where they sang about hating themselves rather than hating the government. The idea was that it was more emotional in comparison to traditional angry and political punk. The second wave in the 90s was akin to what we'd now call indie rock, but with a lot of math rock elements making it very interesting musically. The band American Football are a good example of this. They're musically closer to jazz than what emerged in the 2000s, making extensive use of brass instruments in their music. In this older emo music you couldn't really be an emo it'd be like saying i'm a hip-hop this is really mm. interesting i had no idea even, about yeah. this no um, not at all dads are part of what is known as the emo revival which began just after 2010 and has now basically ended in this revival bands sought to go back to the second wave 90s style dads are admittedly an absolutely w- example of this because <laughs> they are incredibly whiny and no better than the naughty stuff how However, dare you <laughs> However, I just wanted to highlight that they are a different kind of whiny and bad. Whenever dads are brought up in conversations about the revival, people just say, F- dads. Okay. Uh, the yeah. weird- <laughs> this is a great email. The weird history of the genre is best shown by the podcast Washed Up Emo, in which middle-aged musicians from the second wave moan about the eyeliner-wearing youths who stole their genre and admittedly made it successful. Hmm. <laughs> Apologies for this ironically whiny email in which I've tried to argue that not all emo is whiny by whining. To, <laughs> to add to this irony and add an element of sadness to the email, I'd like to weigh in on the cats versus dogs debate, if you're still doing it. I actually received news from the vets that my 15-year-old cat Betty had di- had died while listening to you introduce the debate for the first time in one of the early episodes. A very weird coincidence, but not the most enjoyable. Why do we yeah, not I can imagine. still yeah. not read the emails before we read them out? How are we still making this mistake 57 yeah. episodes deep? Um, however, in classic A-level exam answer fashion, I'd like to sit on the fence. I loved my cat, but I think others are pricks. I find yeah. dogs to be drooling idiots, but I imagine if I had one, I'd love it anyway. Oh, fair enough yeah well um a sad young man who's fed up of telling people he doesn't like my chemical romance or green day i'm very sorry to hear about your cat uh, i understand the pain that you uh, that you go through uh it keenly i i very much remember that pain um so but also thank you very much for this incredibly interesting email i had no idea about the history yeah. of the email genuinely that was super interesting oh there is a postscript sorry uh postscript well done on your half marathon success i did one myself in the summer and loved it must have been fantastic to run it knowing you're raising money for such great causes uh but it was it was a big uh motivation i won't lie it was it was really really good but thank you so much for that email that was that was great fun <laughs> So we're jumping into uh, another section of the podcast. Uh, we're going to pop it into fan fiction um, because I think it, it, it most deservedly has a home there. Um, 
regular regular readers will be thrilled to know that we have uh, some more leader uh, from Woo! William Humphreys, um, poet laureate of the uh, of the podcast. Um, we're going to uh, touch on touch on some of that now. Now, I should also say as well, um, we do have a, quite frankly an an overwhelming amount of um, <laughs> correspondence about the music. Uh, a music survey, yeah. Survey, or I guess? as who yeah. was it? Who uh, I think it was Carl Falsell who gave it the name Track Record, which I just think is a, a yeah. brilliant, like ten out of ten. Would name yeah. again, fantastic, absolutely work. marvelous. Um, yeah, there's 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 a really quite to be honest, a really overwhelming amount of uh, stuff there, um, which is brilliant. Uh, if you haven't already emailed in, please do spongyelectric at gmail dot com. Um, it was your most. Oh, now hang on. It was your most played. Yeah, your most played um, song, your favourite song, and your most recently played song. That's the one. Yeah, uh, and um, we will. You're, you were going to do some statistics on this for yes. next episode. I'm going to do that next week. It gives you some more time to get some more in. Um, it also gives me a time to properly look at it because, as I say, since with with the audition this week, I've just been a little bit a bit frantic. Um, but next week we'll we'll have a proper discussion of that. Um, but without further ado, uh, let's uh, let's have a look at some more leader now. The leader is prefaced with another email from William, so we're going to continue with that now. Dear Mrs. Clark and more, I've prepared another batch of leader poem fan fiction for your reading pleasure. The last episode that you read out, um, you wondered if music should be played along with the poems, and I shall use this moment to remind that leader does does translate to song. I thought I would provide the accompaniment that would usually be played with each poem. Not sure if you'll use it in the end, but hey, it's something. Hope you enjoy, William Humphreys. P.S. Apparently the songs were too large a file. <laughs> My email client <laughs> promises that you'll receive it via some black magic called OneDrive. P.P.S. Note for the mysterious editor. Each file contains a bit of silence at the ends. This was not intended and should be removed while editing. Sorry I'd fix it myself, but it's getting late. Oh, I sorry, can send the files get, in a different format. You don't format. get to boss Adam around. That's our job. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, do uh, I can send the files in a different format if suits, and I hope the naming convention of the styles, files makes sense for you. Continuing with the beautiful Weatherman poems. These are poems 7 to 10 of the ongoing uh, anthology. We begin with 7. Impatience. I'd like to carve it into every table. I'd draw it onto every building's wall. I'd plant it into every garden bed with flowers blooming to show it quickly. I'd gladly write in every single book, my heart is yours and ever will remain. I'd like to train a singer in their art, to bring the words clearly and distinctly that they, the, the music of my heart, perform with all its intensity and longing. Then they would sing it at his widow's clear, my heart is yours and ever will remain. I'd breathe it to the gentle morning breeze, I'd blow across the quiet uni green, if only it would glow from every flower, the scent could carry it from him from afar. The pages in the library could not say, my heart is yours and ever will remain. I'm sure this message to my eyes will show, and all could see it burning in my cheeks. They could read it on my silent lips, my every breath proclaiming it aloud. Yet he does not see my anxious yearning, my heart is yours and ever will remain. 8. Morning greeting. Morning, beautiful weatherman. Why do you quickly hide your head, as if my word disturb? Does my greeting upset you too much? Does my gaze perturb you too much? Then I'll have to go. But just let me sit at a distance, and look towards your table. Afar, I'll keep away. You tall man, please come over. Out from your quiet desk, you clear blue sky. Your eyes are still heavy a bright sky dimmed by clouds. Why do you hide away from the sun? Does your work hold you so much that you hide yourself away from companionship? Now shake off your vial of theories and lift yourself fresh and free into the morning. See there is winds outside. They sing to those who listen the songs of love. 9. The Weatherman's Books there are many tomes in the nook, and some I comprehend. Books are a student student's friend, and my darling speaks of the sky, so these are my books. There on his desk, carefully placed, I'll leave the book in sight. Then they will call to him when he studies so quietly. Then he will listen. When his eyes become so heavy, and his mind yet fuzzy, perhaps for some relief he will read the book I left him and remember me. When he leaves the library late, he will see the books there. He will know they are mine, left for him to read and enjoy, knowing of my love. 
10. Rain of Tears. We sat together, so cosily in the shade of a tree, and we looked together peacefully into the library's evening calm. The moon joined us there in quietness, and the stars thereafter, and looked down on us, comfortingly, reflected in the dark windows. I looked not at the quiet moonlight, or upon, or into the stars. I looked only at his mirrored form, gazing into his eyes only. He nodded and gazed towards the sky from the quiet library. The clouds above, just like in the book, they blinked back down towards my love. And engulfed in the darkened window, the sky seemed to be, and I felt it drawing me up into its endless depths. And behind the clouds and stars, I can still see the books. They seem to call out cheerfully, friend, friend, come to us. But then my eyes overflowed and my my vision blurred. He said, the rain is coming. Farewell, I'm going home. There we are. Wow, it's like it's been, it's been quite a, a quite a journey on on that leader. Yeah, why me? I I really I love these. I get a little bit. I'm, I've just taken off my are glasses. You weepy, are you I'm, I'm having kidding to me? Are you crying slightly? I'm having a little. I'm having a little bit of For a weep. God, yeah. what is it about the people in my life? They can't stop crying. Why do I know such leaky people? If you were a cauldron, you'd be the leaky cauldron. Well, as James said. Crying is good, and it is good. And it's not, I'm not, I don't think it's tears of sadness. It's just nice to read. There's, there's, a, there's so much emotion in, in those poems. They're really kind of, they, they kind of hum and vibrate with, with, with feeling. And I, 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 I bloody love that. <laughs> I never thought that we would have to deal with this as an issue <laughs> in our correspondence, that we would just actually... Thank Dan. you, William. This is it. How many episodes awesome. did it take? Was that fifty-seven episodes before we made Dan cry in a, in a recording? I probably have weeped before. I mean, I'm quite a weepy person yeah, anyway. I mean, but, you know. Statistically, you almost certainly have. But that's the first time I think we've officially managed it. Mm. It's grief. Mm. Well, thank you so much, though. I mean, like that 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 leader mm. has really that that's elevated the game. It's got to be said, William. Thank you, thank you really very has. much. You're truly a leader among men. And uh, thank you so much for what you've brought to the podcast. But we are rather short on time today, so we are probably going to have to wrap things up, aren't we? We are. So, Simon, what have we learned today? Well, Daniel, we have learned about Juris Silovs, who was a uh, sprinter who didn't quite break the 10-second barrier, who sprinted for the Soviet Union and retired after trauma uh, to become a catering entrepreneur. Oh yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> it's been quite a weird episode. We yeah, talked it's been about, really. We talked about the really ten odd. second barrier for quite a while, and then mm. uh, we had a lot of uh, discussion about um, your uh, your uh, piece of the My week audition? and audition. Yeah, uh, yes. and how much it appears that our friend Ed is in uh, the Umbrella Academy, and how everyone should watch yes. it because it's great. Talked a bit about some YouTube drama. We had some follow up from the previous week and some cracking correspondence, uh, including yeah, some really excellent stuff. Really, we've all learned about emo music today. And I'm very, very we happy have. about that. I thought that was great stuff. And we'll all be waiting with bated breath to hear the results of the of the kind of uh, the music survey that this podcast will be conducting. Uh, that will happen next week. So, as I say, if you haven't already emailed in, a lot of you have. Um, the The inbox has been absolutely flooded, which is really wonderful to see. But if you haven't, um, please do email in spongeelectric at gmail dot com. And that's all for this week's episode. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your podcasting service of choice. You can like us on Facebook. And if you'd like to see our faces, check out our YouTube channel, Spongy and Electric. Track records, friends in other Netflix shows, and other thoughts on the show can be sent to us at spongyelectric at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Join us again for another tumble down the wiki rabbit hole. And And we'll we'll see see you next time. time.